they have a simulator. You can actually get in, sit in it. It's just you. It's it's all enclosed, and they can set it up to any weather condition, any driving condition, traffic, any city they want to. Um, they have them in 10 speeds, 18 speeds, 15 speeds, 13 speeds, automatics. And he said he loves it because after the class is over, he can go sit in the simulator and set it up for any weather condition, any driving condition he wants to. Mountainous driving, uh, mountainous driving in the snow, mountainous driving in the rain. He can set it up to any mountain pass in the country that he wants to. He said it's super in-depth. It's The technology behind it is amazing. The answer to last episode's trivia question is 70 feet long. Hey guys, we'll get into the podcast in just a second. However, I'm looking for more great guests for the Blue Collar Voices show, and I've updated this older podcast with this announcement from November 2019. I am planning a road trip across America and including parts of Canada. I'll tell you more about both of these at the end of this podcast. Hello, y'all, and welcome to the Blue Collar Voices show. Our guest today is Michael Paterno. Michael is currently an owner-operator running a transport service. Michael, welcome to the Blue Collar Voices show. Thank you, John. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And, you know, we met on LinkedIn, which is where I'm meeting most of my guests. And uh, I saw a posting of yours. I don't remember exactly what the post was, but you're probably strapping down a load, getting ready to go somewhere. And I know that I know that at one point you were headed to Salt Lake City. Yes, sir. Yeah, I we uh, go all over the place. So, Michael, tell me exactly what it is that you do now. Uh, I currently run a hotshot truck. I'm an owner operator in a F-350 one ton dually with a 40 foot gooseneck. Uh, we transport anything that you would transport on a semi truck under 15,000 pounds is what pretty much you can haul legally on a hotshot truck. Versus a semi truck, you could haul up to forty thousand pounds on a on a flatbed or dry van semi. So it's just we we follow under the same uh, guidelines and requirements and rules and regulations as you would on a semi truck. You need a Class A license. You need to do a logbook when you're going state to state and even interstate. Um, it's it's fun. It's enjoyable. You get to see the country and see some different stuff. And you operate out of Texas. We're based out of yeah. I'm based out of Dallas, Texas. What type of area do you cover? I mean, where out in the United States have you been? The immediate area we cover is Louisiana, Texas, Oklahoma. We cover most of the oil field companies uh, running to the rigs, running to frac sites, uh, running pipe, uh, running drilling tools uh, to different oil field companies, explosives, um, pump parts for frac pump trailers. Anything that basically pertains to the oil field is what we do. But since oil prices are so low, We haven't done much of that. We cover, I've been to Seattle. I've been to Great Falls, Montana. I've been to uh, Fargo, North Dakota, Dickinson, North Dakota. We'll go anywhere. I mean, as far as we have other customers that are not oil field who will send us to spur of a moment, Brooklyn, New York, or uh, Seattle. I've been to San Diego, Los Angeles, wherever. That sounds pretty good as far as getting to see the country. Uh, It's. It's cool. I mean, we, you know, trying to pick up non-oil field customers. So that way when, like in situations like we're in right now where the oil field slows down, we're not held to just one type of customer or one type of industry to haul for. We need to get other customers so that way we can stay busy during the winter time or when oil slows down or the oil field stops drilling, we can still keep moving, you know, keep the truck running, still pay the bills. It's kind of an interesting thing talking about the oil fields. Right now, the prices are down, but we have these vast amounts of oil that we have located and we are able to pull out of the ground. But it's like, since we have so much, the prices go down. And I guess it's not profitable to to work with anymore. Well, they're 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 right now they're using all the reserves so they don't have to drill because we have so much in reserve. And word on the street is apparently when we hit January 2nd, you know, everything will pick back up and we'll be right back to where we were. And hopefully we will see a hundred dollars a barrel because if we do, then, you know, oil field uh, people in the oil field industry won't have to lose their jobs. And people who do the same type of transportation that I do can still maintain and stay busy and won't have to worry about, you know, sitting at the house and trying to figure out 
where money's going to come to pay their bills or put food on the table. If the local oil in our in our market drops down real low, would it be likely that we would start buying oil from overseas at that point? No. No, we're the largest exporter of oil in the world. We just became the largest exporter of oil in the world about two months ago. We've exported okay. We've exported more oil this year than we have in the past 75 years of this country. So I, I guarantee you we'll, we'll never see us buying oil from Saudi Arabia again. We have, we have <laughs> well, more oil in the state of Texas to last us another 500 years. Just in Texas alone, not, that's not including what we're drilling in Oklahoma, what they're drilling in Louisiana, and some of these other places like uh, Eastern California up in the mountains and Wyoming and Montana and Colorado, where they're drilling for oil in those places. Along with that, are we also seeing natural gas come out of some of those same wells or similar wells in the area? Yeah, natural gas is a huge thing now, especially down in South Texas. They're killing it down there in natural gas. We haul for those guys, too, because that's a pretty big market. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm just finding the, the, the context of the price of oil interesting in comparison. I mean, we have all this oil. The prices is dropping, but you're just saying that it's because of our reserve. Well, yeah, because we have so much in reserve and we don't have to buy it from Saudi Arabia. You start drilling again next year to rebuild the reserve back up. So, Okay. But, you know, a lot of, a lot of these guys now, they're all excited, like, you know, everybody's putting all over social media. Oh my God, look, I just paid two thirty a gallon for diesel. Well, you know, the 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 fact of the matter is you pay two thirty a gallon for diesel, but the, the fuel rates drop and the fuel surcharge goes down. So yeah, you're paying cheaper diesel prices, but you're getting cheaper fuel surcharges and cheaper fuel rates or, or cheaper freight rates. So if it comes back up, obviously the, the freight rates will go back up according with the fuel surcharge. But anytime the fuel rates are higher, the fuel surcharge is always higher because the fuel surcharge might be 25 cents a mile or 50 cents a mile, depending on how many miles you're going when you get your fuel surcharge. I think right now I'm getting 15 to 20 cents per mile for fuel surcharge. If you're getting that surcharge and the fuel costs go up, you're getting more of a surcharge, but basically it's not profit. It's just covering your expense. Right. It's just covering your fuel expense. But fuel surcharge is always good because... For some reason, what we've been seeing in the past, like in this past summer when we were super busy, for some reason, the fuel surcharge was really high. And the freight the freight rates were good, but fuel was around three twenty five a gallon. But the freight, the fuel surcharge was higher than what the fuel prices were showing. So the loads paying were amazing. Now we're seeing the freight rates drop or the, the fuel prices drop to two thirty, two forty, two fifty a gallon. Depending on what city, I mean, for some reason, California is still at 415 a gallon, which blows my mind. But we all, all know who California is. W- with the with the fuel prices dropping, the fuel surcharge has dropped tremendously low compared to what it was when it was when the fuel prices were higher. For some reason, the fuel surcharge was way higher than what the fuel prices. Were. Okay. So when you looked at your load, you were like, "Oh man, this is you know this is really good because fuel prices are here. It cost me." 50 cents a mile to run my truck, but I'm getting 40 cents a mile back in fuel surcharge. How long does it take for the for the surcharges to match? Like if fuel prices go up, how quickly does it adapt or, or is there a lag and it hurts you? No, there's a lag. I mean, it might take like a month or two. I'll, I don't know if a lot of my independent buddies are factoring in fuel surcharge with their freight rates. See, being leased on the company that I'm leased to, when they build the rate for the customer, they factor in fuel surcharge. So they tell the customer, okay, so if the load pays $500 and it's going 200 miles, the load's going to pay $500 going 200 miles, but we're going to hit you with another 14 cents per mile over 200 miles for the fuel surcharge. So I'm not a mathematician. I can't do that in my head. So whatever the 14 cents per mile over that 200 miles is that's going to add to the $500 for the freight rate. Okay. Well, and that makes sense. So Michael, tell me a little bit about how you actually got started in this industry. I'm sure that when you were 12 years old in school, you had visions of doing different things. We never know where we're going to wind up and what we're going to do. How did you wind up being a hotshot driver? I was, uh, I've been a big truck driver for the previous 10 years of my life. I just decided to get into hotshot six, seven months ago. I grew up around trucks. Uh, my grandpa was a truck driver. Uncles in my family 
uh, owned a large trucking company in Connecticut. My, my mom's uncle owned a big company called Westchester County Motor Lines in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, they had about 100, 150 big trucks. So I was kind of raised around it when I went. When I got into high school, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I was in, wanted to be a pilot or be a truck driver. When I, I graduated high school by the seat of my pants, I was like, well, I, I'm not sure if I'm going to go to college. So I ended up going to truck driving school for three months at a really good uh, community college in the state of Florida. And they really, I mean, they really got deep in, in truck driving and really made you understand, you know, how to, in order for you to graduate, you had to drive 2,000 miles in the class. All the instructors were certified Florida State instructors, so they could give you the road test when you when you went through the school. They were certified to road test you and tell you if you passed or failed. So that way, when you passed, you took your paper and you brought it to the DMV. They would print your license out for you. You had to do 200 hours in a classroom. And you had to do, uh, I think it was 40 or 80 hours of spending just time with the truck, just outside the truck, just going over the truck, learning the truck. Uh, sitting in the truck, understanding the truck. We had to, it was a very in-depth uh, CDL training program at Florida Community College in Jacksonville. It was probably one of the best CDL training programs I've ever seen of how in-depth it was. And it was awesome because financial aid and you can get grants or scholarships to pay for it. So you didn't have to pay for truck driving school out of pocket, which was awesome. I've actually never heard that truck driving school was quite that intensive. I just thought it was more like a... well. Some of these other uh, truck driving schools, they kind of do it, you know, fly by night. Uh, I don't want to mention any names, but they're mostly in big cities. You know, they kind of just uh, go through it really fast. You know, it's kind of shady the way that they want you to put down $1,500 before you even get started. It's it just I don't know. It just seems kind of shady. And then they, they force the truck down your throat. You know, you some some of these guys are getting pushed out of these truck driving schools in two two weeks or, you know, three weeks, which is. You know, I know there's a truck driver shortage, and I understand that we have a truck driver shortage, and there's a certain way to go about it and try to bring people into truck driving. I don't think pushing them through a school in two weeks to drive an 80,000 pound machine is the way to do it. But that's that's the part that concerns me is safety. Yeah, uh, yeah, there's a huge safety reason. I think that you should be able to drive at 18. I don't see why you couldn't cross state lines at 18 years old. I think that's ridiculous. Um, you know, they, they have the 20, the minimum age of 21. I, there's no problem with getting your CDL at 18 and crossing state lines. I did. I got my CDL at 18 and it took me, uh, almost two and a half years to get a job. I had to drive a straight truck part time in Palm Beach County, Florida, just to, so I could use my CDL to get experience, but nobody would hire me because I was only 18 years old. So when I graduated and went home, I drove a straight truck for 13 bucks an hour part time just to get some kind of experience. But I think if you can fight for your country at 18 and go overseas and fight for the great country of the United States of America, go overseas, be in war, IEDs, AR-15 or uh, M4s, uh, shootouts with terrorists. If you can do all that, there's no reason why you can't drive a semi truck down the road at 60, 65 miles an hour hauling a load at 18 years old crossing state lines. I think they should be able to, but I think if you're gonna if you're gonna lower the CDL age to 18, which you and most people don't know that you can get your CDL at 18, you can get your CDL at 18. You just can't cross state lines. A lot of people think you have to wait till you're 21 to get your CDL, but that's not true. You can get your CDL at 18 in any state. You just can't leave the state once you have it. Um, I think that they should be able to open that up to 18. You should be able to cross state lines at 18 with the proper training. There's no reason why an 18 or 19 or 20 year old couldn't cross a state line in a big truck. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, I'm sure there's reasons for it. I'm not saying I'm for it or against it, but I would say that. Oh, yeah. I don't see the two being equatable as far as like if you can go in the military and die for your country because you have a lot less. I, th I think those two contexts are so different in the one. It's a war you're shooting and. And let's just face it. Half those people are just treated as fodder anyway, which means that they're 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 expendable. And I hate to say that, but I think that there's some truth to that. And if you're in a truck and you're 18 and you make a decision that 
you're not as regimented. I mean, if you're 18 and you're in war, everybody's telling you where to go, what to do, how to move, what you're going to do next. You're 18 years old. You're in a highway. You may make a, a choice that's not quite as wise yet. And the impact isn't just you. The impact could be where you, you, you wipe out a number of vehicles. And that's just, just looking on it quickly without actually an in depth. Oh, yeah. But that happens every day now with guys who are, have been in the behind the wheel for 20 years. We see it all the time, guys. Uh, a couple months, a couple years ago, that Walmart driver fell asleep behind the wheel in California, and that bus driver, who was a bus driver for what fifteen years, slammed right in the back of the truck because he didn't right. even see it. I I absolutely agree. So guys with experience, so even guys with experience are making mistakes. But if you have an eighteen year old, a nineteen year old, or twenty one year old, send them to a real good CDL school. You know, send them to a six month program. Hey, look, if you want to get your CDL, that's fine. We'll send you to a six-month program. It will be very intense, super in-depth. Uh, you have to drive with an instructor for 5,000 miles, whatever. I mean, there's there's ways around it. I mean, my, 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 my CDL school that I went to, the training program was very in-depth. I had an accident when I was younger. You know, it happens to everybody. So it just, you know, it just depends on what the severity is and how you adapt and overcome. And obviously... The, the people on the road, they have to make the right decisions because a lot of these people don't know how to drive around a truck. It's amazing. We do have the aspect that, that when you're younger, you are likely to make more rash decisions. I know I did, and I had some incidences with vehicles that that now, as an adult, it's been quite some time since I've actually been in an accident, you know, high speed moving and making a poor decision that led to a, to a situation. Right. And when I was younger, sure, I did. I, I made those mental I made those mental, those mental, I just, you know, yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it. It'll be all right. And it wasn't all right. <laughs> so you're talking about doing, you're talking about doing the in-depth training. And I think that if we are doing in-depth training and we are also looking at the, if in some way we could actually look at the, the, the ability of that person to make good judgments, right. somehow analyzing that and saying, yeah, okay, you are. You're not the just the foolhardy rush to do whatever. You're you're somebody that's going to take a measured approach, and we're going to let you out. You're at a younger age. You have shown yourself. I think that's I think that's a valid way to approach that. One of my cousins is going to CDL school right now in Minneapolis, and uh, he's in his early 30s. And I've been telling him for years to go get it. So he's going to go. He's in the program getting a CDL. They have a simulator. Like for like a, a simulator, like at a, at a, a uh, for like an airline, like Southwest Airlines has simulators at their corporate office. Sure, sure. They have a simulator. They have quite a few of them. You can actually get in, sit in it. It's just you. It's it's all enclosed. Nobody can see inside. You can't see outside. And they can set it up to any weather condition, any driving condition, traffic, any city they want to. Um, they have them in ten speeds, eighteen speeds, fifteen speeds, thirteen speeds, automatics. And he said he loves it because after the class is over, he can go sit in the simulator and set it up for any weather condition, any driving condition he wants to. Mountainous driving, uh, mountainous driving in the snow, mountainous driving in the rain. He can set it up to any mountain pass in the country that he wants to. He said it's super in-depth. It's The technology behind it is amazing. He said, actually, in the class, the requirement is for the students. They have to sit in that simulator for two weeks. That's what they have to do for two weeks for like six hours a day. They have to ride that simulator. I mean, they can get out, take a lunch break, take a break, whatever. But they have to stay in that simulator for two weeks till the instructor signs off that they did their two weeks. It's amazing. But if we had something like that at every truck driving school, imagine what these kids can do. They could These 18, 19, 20-year-olds, they could set up any kind of weather condition or any kind of scenario they wanted to to put these people in situations like, hey, we're going to put you in the situation. What would you do if you're stuck in New York City in the middle of a snowstorm? What are you going to do? Or whatever, right? It, it can even be used as a way of overtraining, like taking them to like you're you're never going to see this in real life, or if you do, it's going to be highly unusual. Right. But you expose people to a higher level of of this stress, so the regular driving they're going to handle it with a depth ease. Overtraining is there's nothing wrong with overtraining. I knew simulators for planes existed. I had no idea that they existed for the truck driving. I think that's phenomenal. I didn't know they existed for truck driving until he told me. I said, dude, that's amazing. I would go in that. He goes, dude, the class is from 7 to 3, Monday through Friday. As soon as the class is over at 3 o'clock, he goes, I'm sitting in that simulator for at least an hour or two. 
I, I think that's great. And it also gives somebody the feeling of, can I sit here and do this? It may help somebody avoid somebody making a, a career choice that they're not going to be happy with. Oh, he said, he said, it's amazing. He goes, it's actually just, uh, he enjoys driving the 10 speed. So, cause that's what he learned how to drive on with his previous, uh, heavy equipment company he used to, to work for as a mechanic. He, they taught him how to drive a 10 speed. So he's been wor- learning in the simulator on the 10 speed. He said, it's amazing. He goes, it's like just sitting in a, in a big truck driving down the highway. He goes, I could set it up to to whatever mountain pass I want to in the entire country going through the, the mountains in Idaho into, into Washington or whatever. <laughs> I said, that's amazing. I said, you should eat that up and do that all the time. Yeah. That, that sounds like, that sounds just like an interactive video game that would be fun regardless of the practical applications. Oh, I mean, he said even the shifting, like the, the shifting and like when you let off the clutch and you're in, like when I drove a big truck, I start off in third or fourth. If I'm loaded, I probably start off in second. But if I'm empty, I'll start off in third or fourth. But he goes, you can you can set the weight in the truck. So he goes, before you get in, you can put the empty weight of a truck is around 30, 35,000 pounds. He goes, you can set it up empty or you can set it up. You can pick what weight you want. You can put it at 8,000 pounds if you wanted to. He goes, when you let off the clutch and you start off in first or second, he said, it's like you're really in a truck. He goes, it's amazing. He goes, it's absolutely incredible. He goes, I start off in first. He goes, when I let off the clutch, he goes, I'll put 80,000 pounds before I get in rain conditions, wet conditions, whatever, flat ground floor to however he wants to set it up. He said, I'll put it in first, let off the clutch. He goes, the truck and the computer said the truck is loaded. So he goes, when I let off the clutch, he goes, it actually torques up like I'm actually in a big truck in real life that machine will actually talking about like shifting like shifting the cab. Yeah, well, actually, yeah, the, the cab will actually shift like there's weight in the in the truck. That's awesome. So he goes, it's amazing. That's a high level of sophistication. That's great. We need more uh, trucking companies should actually buy those things and put them in their corporate offices. Some of your top carriers should buy those. I think the idea of having the training or having these available all over would be good if the companies would actually invest into making sure that their drivers are trained. I think that training is one of those things that even if you're competent, sometimes coming back to the basics, just a little refresher course can help also, you know, we, we learn more. The The world changes every every so often. And if you had to come back in every five years and say, take a, just take a, a half day training course, I think that could probably be beneficial. I'm throwing those numbers out. I have no idea. Once, once a year, uh, a full day of just, you know, basic driver training and just understand I'm the basics. I mean, even in my truck, a 40 foot trailer, my trailer weighs 8,000 pounds. My truck weighs 9,000 pounds. Even when I'm empty and I'm coming through the mountains, I'll still do, you know, 10 miles an hour under the speed limit coming through the mountain. Cause I mean, it, it, it's crazy. It's just, and I got, I got, I'll be going down a mountain pass and a big truck will be blowing my doors off going down a mountain pass. And I'm like, what are you doing? I was hauling a shipping container from Seattle to Denver probably about two months ago. And I was going up a mountain pass in, uh, I think it was in Oregon. I was almost into Utah. It was right at the end of my trip, uh, right before I was going to stop for the night. And we were going up a mountain pass. So 45 miles an hour, it was three lanes wide. I was in the right lane. A lot of the other big trucks were in the right lane. We were going up. It was a whole bunch of S-curves. It was like a 6% grade for like four mm-hmm. miles going up with a whole bunch of S-curves. And in the in the left lane, here comes some, some uh, hotshot Peterbilt driver with a long nose 379 Pete running like 85 miles an hour up this mountain pass going through these S curves in the left lane. And it was, at, it, was, it was getting dark too. It was like dusk. And here's this guy doing 90 miles an hour. I'm like, oh, go ahead on. Go ahead with your bad self truck driver. <laughs> I'm like. And that was going uphill? Yeah, we were going uphill. He was running probably. He, he might have not been doing 90. He was probably doing easily 60 or 70 miles an hour up this mountain pass. He was probably empty. Right. Um, so, uh, but he just went up this hill, like he's been driving a truck for 350 years. It's one of those things that it doesn't just impact him. It impacts you all. And if, even if, even if he got up there and he did something and it only impacted him, it could have stalled traffic. So there's that as well. Right. Right. It was just, it's just stupid. You talk about visiting all these places. I, myself, I've, I'm not a, I don't, all I have is just a regular class C license. But I do, I have driven all over the United States. I love driving. I love going up in the mountains. I like exploring new territory. The idea of what you're talking about doing 
is one that appeals to me just because just getting to see so much territory. And if it was me, I would be one of those guys that I don't want to, I would want to be able to just like always, not always, but pretty much just always be on the road, travel here, travel there, and just, you know, pick up a place and go to another place and go to another place and just kind of crisscross all over the United States. That's, that's how I would like to see myself. If I was able to do that, that would be fun. I think. Obviously, if you're not on the road, you're not making any money. If you're at the house, you're not making any money unless you're a broker or some type of sales rep or dispatcher or something. Or you own a slew of trucks and you don't have to be on the road. You have to be smart about where you go to because a lot of places don't have a lot of good freight. A lot of the freight rates aren't good. And every the freight rates might be good coming out of Texas, but they might not be good coming back into Texas. The The Midwest, all the states up in the Midwest, Kansas, uh, Iowa, uh, Minnesota, Nebraska, uh, you know, cities like Kansas City, Minneapolis, Des Moines, uh, St. Louis, uh, Louisville. Um, the, the center part of the country seems to be really good with freight like what I do and even even big truck freight and hot shop freight. Um, so you have to be real selective on where you go to when you exit the state of Texas. Um, the, the company that I work for, unfortunately, um, it, it's hard what we do because they don't they don't work as hard as they should getting us back hauls. I see. So w- we get high freight rates leaving the state of Texas, depending on where we go to. They have we have probably the best rates in the country, but you know, a couple of weeks ago, I hauled something for four dollars a mile. Well, four dollars a mile is incredible. I haul explosives for over six or seven dollars a mile, but it doesn't mean anything if you don't get a backhaul, right? Because if I go somewhere for four hundred mile, if I go somewhere for four hundred miles at four dollars a mile, if I come back empty, I'm actually getting two dollars a mile, right? Just because I'm leaving the state of Texas at four dollars a mile doesn't mean crap. I need to get a load back to make it worth my while. Yeah, I'm still probably making money at two dollars a mile, but I'm not really winning. I'm just spinning your wheels, money. I'm right? Making a little bit. Yeah, I'm just spinning my wheels. So, you know, the dispatchers will, uh, you know, my, my dispatcher will call me and tell me, "Oh my God, Michael, we got you a load. It's so good. It, it's going a thousand miles. It's paying. It's paying uh three fifty nine a mile." Okay, well, yeah, that's great. That's three fifty nine a mile going a thousand miles, but if I break that down over two thousand miles, it's actually like a dollar forty something a mile. Right. So it's not really that good. Now, if you get me three fifty nine a mile going a thousand miles, and then you get me a dollar fifty nine coming back or a dollar sixty coming back, now we're talking. Now we're doing real good. Now we're winning. Right. Because that that load coming back to Dallas is paying for fuel. It's paying for my maintenance. And it's paying for, you know, it's paying for fuel, paying for maintenance, paying for hotels, paying for food. Why my load going up there was profit. Right. Does the option exist? Let's say you did get that route going a thousand miles one way, but instead of coming back directly to Texas, you were able to, could you pick up a load going from say that location to say to Kentucky or going to, to some other place. And then you kind of just jump around a little bit. Does it, is it easier to find loads if you're willing to do that? Yeah, because you can. If I'm going to go out 500 or 1,000 miles, I don't have to come back to Texas. But if I can get somewhere uh, close to Texas, like I always look to come back to Louisiana. Louisiana always has pretty good freight or Arkansas always has pretty good freight. So if I can go from here to, to Chicago, I mean, some, some there's a lot of freight coming out of Chicago coming back to Texas. But if I can find something good coming into Arkansas or Louisiana or Oklahoma City, I'll also do that too. And then if I can find some coming from Oklahoma City to Houston, you just have to, when you're looking at the load board, you just have to play with it. Right. You know, kind of look at what your options are. Kind of, you know, when, if you're going from Dallas, we always get loaded out of Dallas because our direct customers are in Dallas. The problem is when we get outside of Dallas and get to these other cities, what can we find coming back? So, you know, you jump on the load board. If you're going Dallas to Chicago, just jump on the load board, type in Chicago you know, do a deadhead, uh, a deadhead of a hundred miles, kind of see what's in there and you'll see everything coming back, whether it's, you know, grab something coming into Louisiana, grab something coming into Arkansas, grab something coming into Texas. You don't have to come, you don't have to always come home, but if you're more of a Monday through Friday guy, if you leave Dallas loaded on Monday, you're going to get to Chicago Wednesday, deliver, if you can get something coming back to Dallas on Wednesday, you'll be back to Dallas on Friday. You know what I mean? Right. Right. And if you got a, if you have a family, it could be more important. 
Yeah, if you have a family, you know, most, most me and my buddies, we try to just, you know, stay loaded Monday through Friday, be home Saturday and Sunday. But the freight rates are better on the weekends because there's less drivers to choose from. So you can get a higher rate on a Saturday or Sunday. You had mentioned the board. Is this something that's nationwide where most most everybody uses this? Are there multiple boards? Yeah, there's multiple load boards. There's probably 10 or 15 load boards and anybody can have access to them. Okay. You just have to pay a fee. There's different fees. And they, it's kind of stupid. They charge the fee depending on how fast you want the load board to refresh. So if you're looking at it on your laptop or your iPad and you're sitting in your truck, it can automatically refresh every second because so many brokers around the country are posting loads and you want to be able to see those loads as soon as they post. So that way, when they post, you can make a phone call and be like, hey, I'm interested in this load you got going from Chicago to Atlanta. And I'm like right here. I can take it now. Yeah. I mean, it's a matter of being real quick. If, if you're not quick or, or you get caught up in being busy, like while you're unloading, say, for example, you have your computer in your truck. It's set up on the load board that you're set up to. I'm set up on one load board. Uh, some of my buddies are set up on two or three load boards. If if you have the computer in your truck set to the load board, but you're in your truck unloading, well, while you're getting unloaded, there could have been three or four loads posted in that 30 minutes or that 10 minutes that you were unloading. And those loads have already gotten picked up by other drivers because you were outside getting loaded. So you always have to be on top right. of it, always paying attention right. to it, always looking at it. Is there a service that you can get that can can help you? For instance, if you say, look, find me these loads, find me this kind of work, and they'll actually find that for you and just kind of set it up? Yeah, you can hire a dispatcher. You can hire a dispatch okay. service. Okay. There's plenty of dispatch services. You can hire. They take a percentage of the load. You just tell them where you want to go or whatever. They'll, they'll pay you a percentage of the load. Um, also, too, you know, another thing that me and a lot of my other buddies were talking about, it's unfortunate because... I don't know why the industry is, but it's almost like they're trying to weed out the hotshot drivers. Like they just, they feel like the hotshot drivers might be messing up the industry for the big truck drivers. Hmm. So what I'm noticing now on a lot of the load boards and a lot of my buddies are telling me when they're looking at the load board, there's quite a few load boards. When they're looking at the load board, depending on what load board they have an account set up with, you could click on a load and it will say no hotshot trucks. And we're starting to find more and more of that uh, over over the over, over the course of probably the last six or seven months. Every time you click on a load, if it's under fifteen thousand pounds and you click on it, for some reason they won't accept hotshot trucks. I called on a load in Salt Lake City. It was twenty five hundred pounds, twenty foot long, coming right back to Dallas. Well, when I clicked on the load, I said that's a perfect load for me. I mm -hmm. clicked on the load. I went to call, and the lady said the broker told me no hotshot trucks uh, except. I said, okay, well, that's, that's, I mean, that's, that's right up my alley. Perfect weight, perfect length for my trailer because my trailer is 40 foot long. She goes, we don't accept hot shot trucks. I said, okay, well, you have a good day. But, you know, I'm not the only one that's running into this. A lot of my buddies that I talk to on LinkedIn and Instagram are running into the same things. Right. So we're trying to figure that out as far as why they're trying to weed out hot shot trucks in the industry. I know a lot of the big truck drivers look down on us because they think we're the ones driving the freight rates down, but we're getting better freight rates than they are. I was talking to a big truck driver, the owner operator the other day. He's like, yeah, he goes, we were talking at the fuel island. He goes, yeah, I'm just out here. I'm getting a dollar 57 a mile. And I'm like, a dollar 57 a mile. How the hell are you making any money at a dollar 57 a mile when you drive a, you're driving a, a 2014 Freightliner Cascadia. Right. And, and, and I'm out here. I'm out here getting 350 a mile and I'm driving this truck, this Ford F350. You know, the, the fact of the matter is, you know, I've, I've run into quite a few big truck drivers that assume that just because we're in a hot truck truck, we're driving the rates down. Well, that's not true. We're not driving the rates down. We're in, we're in it to win it just like you guys are. So we want the freight rates as high as they can be. Right. You're not, you're not doing, you're not trying to lowball. You want, you want the money. No, I mean, I, I want to haul $5 a mile just like they want to haul $5 a mile. I, the problem is I think it's a lot of these foreigners, you know, picking up a lot of these foreigners are running the, these big trucks for 80 cents a mile. You can't make any money at 80 cents a mile. So if you're hauling 40,000 pounds at 80 cents a mile, what's going to happen is every time you, you know, you call in a load and you'll be like, hey, I noticed you posted a load is 25,000 pounds going a thousand miles from point A to point B. How much is the, uh, I'm willing to do it for $3 a mile. And you call them and be like, screw that. I got a guy that will do it for $1.50 a mile. Well, I'm not putting 40,000 pounds on my trailer. 
whether I'm in a big truck, obviously you can't do that in a hotshot truck, but if I'm in a big truck, I'm not putting 40,000 pounds on my trailer for $1.50 a mile. Oh, well, we got two guys that did it last week for $1.50 a mile, so we're just going to call them. Okay, we'll just call them. Why'd you even post it on the load board? Just call those guys. At that point, you're not making any money. But if you're not making any money, how is it even possible that the bigger truck would be making any money? Good question. Either their their truck and trailer must be paid off or or a lot of these guys, a lot of these guys just haul freight just to keep the truck on the road. They're not making any money at all. They're just pretty much keeping the truck running down the highway. That's all they're doing. Is there a benefit to that? No. Okay. And a lot of time, and, and I don't mean any disrespect to any of these foreigners that come over to America and buy a big truck and a trailer, but 90% of the time, it's those guys. Right. And they may be playing a different game. They may they may be doing something to help establish themselves, and later they'll be right. shifting up. I, I don't know what that game is, but if, if they're doing it at a loss, or there's got to be a reason for it. But when you think about it, it doesn't make sense that you would be getting, say, $5 a mile. And also a big truck would also be getting, because if you're getting $5 a mile and your expenses are lower, then you would think that the big truck would get more because not only are their expenses more, but they're hauling like five, 10 times more. So they're doing more work per mile than what your truck can do per mile. Right. Yeah. It's just, you know, you, you, you hear all these stories at the truck stop. I don't know how true they are. Obviously it's always truck stop talk, but you hear (laughs) these guys. Oh, I know this guy that he hauled something for 95 cents a mile or he hauled. So when you look at the load board, I was looking this morning. I saw something going from Dallas to uh, Brooklyn, New York. It was 20 foot. It, it weighed 6,000 pounds. They wanted, I think, $700 and it was going 1,200 miles. So you divide $700 by 1,200 miles. You're making whatever that is. Not very much. Yeah, you're making, uh, I'm not a good math, but you're making 58 cents. It's 58 cents a mile. Now it says partial, but if it's 30 foot long and it's going on my trailer and it weighs 5,000 pounds, it's kind of hard for it to be a partial because my trailer is only 40 foot long. Right. So I have to be able to find something 10 foot to fit in that space. Plus your load is already five or six or 7,000 pounds. Now that limits me how much I can actually put the rest on my trailer. Now I have to find something 10 foot, you know, six or five or 6,000 pounds that will fit within my 15,000 pound weight limit. That I can put on my trailer. And that's going to be a lot more difficult. Right. Just like just trying to find like some big pump or a huge welder or just it's just going to be some random thing. Right. No, you're exactly right. So we're in a we're we're going through interesting times right now in our in the freight business. You know, truck and truck and trailer sales were at an all time high for like the past four months. And then all of a sudden, I think it was uh, December I want to say December 3rd or December 4th, I was reading an article. Somebody had posted an article on LinkedIn and all of a sudden all the truck and trailer sales came to a screaming halt because of the fuel prices in the freight market. And I'm sure most of the truck and trailer sales were big companies. You know, your JB Hunts of the world and your Snyders of the world where they have a truck and a trailer contract with a company and they can just be like, hey, we want to order a thousand trailers. Okay. Hey, we're not going to order those trailers anymore. Just put them on hold. And that has a big impact. That is a huge impact. I mean, I can't go to a trailer dealership or a truck dealership and order, put in an order on a hundred fifty thousand pound, a hundred fifty thousand dollar Peterbilt and a forty thousand pound, a forty thousand dollar flatbed, and then all of a sudden be like, "Hey, I don't want it no more." You know what I mean? Right. They got to know that you're going to be a serious buyer for buying a hundred, a two hundred thousand dollar setup. They're probably already financed and agreed upon and that type of thing. But you know, a lot of these big carriers, they have these big these big contracts with Freightliner and Kenworth and International that they can pretty much do whatever they want. Yeah, we're going to put an order for 500 trucks. Ah, we're not going to bother. We don't need those trucks anymore. The freight slowed down so dramatically. Fuel prices are low. We'll just keep the trucks on hold for next year. So they tell you that truck and trailer sales are at an all-time high, They don't, but they don't specify whether it's owner-operator based or if it's company based. Is, is truck and trailer sales at an all-time high because people are becoming owner-operators? Or are truck and trailer sales at an all-time high because companies are trying to increase hiring drivers? You know what I mean? They don't specify. They just say truck and trailer sales are at an all-time high. Oh, my God, everybody, the freight industry is so good. And then all of a sudden, one day you see an article, hey, truck and trailer uh, sales came to a screeching halt. I think that's one of the cases where you got to dig into the numbers. It's what they call lies, lies, and damn statistics. Isn't that the expression? Mm -hmm. 
And so what that means is you, you, you can say one thing, but until you actually get into it, I remember hearing in history class, the teacher was talking and when Hitler was doing his thing back, back then, some of the generals, they'd want to give him news, but they did not want to tell him that the ever that they were retreating right. in any situation. So they would just tell Hitler that, you know, that the army is on the move and right. he would be happy. And, and because if they would have said that there was retreating, Hitler was just as likely to shoot the guy that delivered the bad news. Right. And so you can say something, but it may not, it sounds one way, but hey, it could really be another way. Right. Well, there, you know, there's three sides to every story. <laughs> and they are. There's, there's one side, there's the other side, and then there's the truth. Yeah, that sounds right. I'm going to switch gears a little bit and ask you, what's the most scenic place that you've seen out on the road? Well, it depends. I like the beach, but I also like the mountains. I really enjoy trucking through Florida and trucking through the Keys and stuff and, you know, seeing, you know, the Gulf of Mexico on the right side and the Atlantic Ocean on the left side, depending on if you're going south or north on US-1. Um, right. Uh, Western Montana is amazing going into Idaho. That's incredible. Uh, Salt Lake City, uh, Utah is really awesome because you don't actually drive in the mountains. You just drive in the valleys. So you're always on flat ground. You're just you're still looking at the right. mountains, but you're always on flat ground. Whereas where you're, when you're in Idaho, you're you know at a six or seven thousand foot elevation, going up six or seven percent grades and going down six or seven percent grades. Where you know it's twenty degrees at the top of the mountain and fifty degrees at the bottom of the mountain. So it could be snowing up there and sunny down at the bottom. Right. So that's always annoying because you never know what the top of the mountain's going to do. You can figure out what the temperature is, you know, if you're looking at an app on your phone. Hey, it's, uh, you know, 47 degrees in Spokane, Washington. But if you keep trucking down 94 or 90 and you get up into the mountains, hey, there might be 10 inches of snow in the mountains, you know, so you don't know. It doesn't, unless the, you're driving on the highway, they got those billboards that will tell you, hey, chain up, you know, snow in the mountains or whatever, roads closed or whatnot. Right. And so, obviously, you're not going to chain up your trailer tires. It's not going to make any – I wouldn't assume that would make any difference. I haven't had to yet, but I have seen some of my friends have had to do it. I guess in certain states, DOT does require you for you to chain your front axle of your trailer tires. Okay. I don't know why, but I think you just you should just be able to chain up your truck and go. And when you do chain up, are you chaining up all four tires or all six if you're running a dually? Um, no, just the rear, just, just the outer rear. on a, on, on a, on a dually, just the outer rear is fine. Okay. Some guys chain up both the inner, the inner and the outer, or you can just chain up the outer on both sides. What's your speed limited to when you're chained up? <clears throat> I think, uh, it depends on what the state requires. Some states 15, 20. I mean, you probably, probably you wouldn't really go over 30 miles an hour. Okay. I'd be doing like 20, 15 or 20 up a mountain. Right. Salt Lake or Utah is super. Every every state, every state has it. I like going east. I like going down I-10 and I-20. Those are my favorite highways to truck up and down. It's flat and warm. <laughs> I like warmth. I hate the cold. Well, you know, I I lived in Texas for you know since eighty from eighty four to about two thousand fourteen. Come on back. It's hot. <laughs> I am not a fan of the heat. I'm you know, I, literally literally the heat just is just excruciating for me. I highly prefer between the feeling of being overheated and versus being cold. I prefer the cold. Yeah, I'm I'm opposite. I like shorts and a tank top and flip flops. It's just we do vary so much in our physiologies. We had talked a little bit about before we got the before we got started recording about self driving and electric trucks. And you had told me that you think self driving is a ways off, but electric trucks are going to be here pretty soon. Yeah, electric trucks will be here pretty soon. All the all the major uh, manufacturers have said they'll have an electric truck out by 2020. Uh, Tesla's truck is the ugliest truck out of all of them. I think that's a horrible looking truck. It looks like a spaceship. I do like the Freightliner Cascadia electric truck. It looks just like a Cascadia. I, I'm, I've been driving. I drove Cascadias for a long time at uh uh, a couple of the freight carriers that I worked for. I'm a huge fan of the Freightliner Cascadia. I think it's a great fleet truck. They're reasonably priced. Uh, they're very economical. Some of the newer models have 
very minor maintenance issues, major components that break. Freightliner is coming out with a electric version of the Cascadia, and it's a sharp looking truck. I don't know. I I was reading an article, something about uh, it's going to have 700 instantaneous horsepower. So as soon as you hit the gas, you're looking at 700 horsepower and over a thousand, a thousand or 1200 foot pounds of torque. Well, I know that I know that with electric cars, they actually have something that softens that instantaneous on. So it's not a square wave. Otherwise, you wind up breaking axles and things like that when you apply that much torque all at once. Right. But. There is a tremendous amount of power that's available. One of the things that I'm curious about, and you may know the answer to this, what about, you know, like refueling, like when you're running out of power, you know, what's your distance like? How how does all the logistics of being able to go cross country in an electric truck work out? That is going to be interesting. I haven't done a whole bunch of research on that. That's it's going to be interesting on how they figure out where they're going to put these uh, battery chargers at. Most of these trucks uh, will only be able to get like a 200 mile range. So I think for the meantime, they'll be local. I'm reading here that this uh, the new electric, the new elect, uh, the new electric Cascadia will have 730 peak horsepower with batteries located at the axle and it will regenerate uh, a lot of these trucks. They're going to try to uh, implement something on the axles to where it regenerates electric by itself. Yeah. The regenerative braking. Yeah. So I think that's smart. Like if, if you're working your way, and you've, even if you're just coming up to a stoplight, it could probably buy you. I don't know what the percentage is, but I think that that could be very helpful. Yep. Yeah. It's uh it's going to be an interesting, uh, the next, uh, the next five years in trucking is going to be really, really interesting. With electric trucks, uh, I don't think the self-driving trucks is a good idea. Um, obviously, if you do self-driving truck, you're going to be putting people out of work. Unless they plan on creating a whole bunch of positions inside these offices that can promote these truck drivers out of trucks and put them in an office somewhere. As far as like logistics. So one of my last questions is, what do you think the overall career potential is in in trucking? You know, whether it's hot shot, regular trucking, how does it look? How how would you, if you were able to predict, what would you think? I think it's a great career. I just wish a lot of these companies um, took more time with their employees. You know, you see a lot of these great CEOs say a lot of these uh, great things about training their employees making them stay, helping them grow within the company so they don't want to leave. Right. Uh, some of the great sayings that, um, what's the CEO for Apple's name? The old CEO. Tim the Cook? Guy that passed, no, the guy that passed oh, away. Jobs? Yeah, Steve Jobs. Some of the great things that Steve Jobs has said about his employees, about training them so they stay at the company and they don't have to leave. I've worked for numerous trucking companies that I would have loved to stay working for. But because they wouldn't let me move up in the company, I had to start moving around. And uh, some of the companies I worked for, I worked for the largest carrier probably in the country. And, uh, you know, I loved working for this company and I wanted to move up in that company so bad. I wanted to go be a sales rep. I tried. They had two or three sales positions. I I applied. I uh, applied. They had a couple of doc supervisor positions. I applied. They had a manager training program that I applied for. They had a uh, sales rep training program that I applied for. Uh, a lot of these trucking companies, they don't, they don't really take time in trying to help their drivers move up in the company. They rather either hire from the outside off the street instead of, instead of using the drivers that they have in the company to fill some of these dispatcher spots and to fill some of these dock supervisor spots and to fill some of these uh, sales rep spots. I mean, uh, uh, a retar- an ex-truck driver makes the best dispatcher. Obviously, they know the roads, they know the freight, they know where it goes, they run the areas, they can dispatch other drivers very easily. Also, too, the drivers are the ones who see the customer face-to-face, whether it's a shipper or the receiver. So they would make a great sales rep because all you're doing, you're not actually selling something. Uh, being a sales, uh, Being in sales is just talking to people. It's not hard to sell a product if you know how to talk to people. Um, it, and they also make good dock supervisors because when they're on the dock, they see the freight. Obviously, they watch their freight get loaded in the morning. They tell the 
I remember when I worked for my the different freight carriers that I worked for, I would go on the dock and tell the dock, you know, tell the loader, hey, you know, put this over here because I'm going to do this stop first. You know, if I got 10 or 15 stops, um, uh, 10 or 15 deliveries, I'm going to tell them, hey, man, uh, load this like this or load this like that, you know, or sometimes they would load it backwards or screwed up. And then, you know, hey, man, I noticed that you did this yesterday. If you could do this today to make it easier for me when I get to the customer, that would be great. Right. So I think the the career is great, but my problem was I, I was a very good driver when I was in a big truck, and I my goal was to move up in some of these companies. But I had my terminal manager tell me that I can't move up because I'm too good of a driver. You know that's not fair to me. I want to move up. I want to. I don't want to be a truck driver until I'm 90 years old. I I want to move up to sales or I want to move up to a uh, dispatcher. But they don't put anything together for these drivers to want to move up in the company. That's why you see these guys who are 75 years old still driving a truck. That's ridiculous. Create something at your home terminal, you know, or create something for these drivers to want to move up in the company or give us an incentive to, hey, man, they're they're putting in for a, a dock supervisor position. Every time a position was posted on the board in the break room, hey, we're looking for a new dock supervisor. Hey, we're looking for a new operations manager. Hey, we're looking for a new dispatcher. None of the drivers ever got it. Five drivers could put in for that position and five drive, uh, five dock workers or five people from another company could put in for that same position. And either the dock worker that worked in the company, which that's good because you obviously want to see dock workers move up in the company right? or people from outside that company from another freight carrier would get it over the driver that already works for that freight carrier. And I think I think promoting from within is the way to go. I don't think hiring off the street, unless they ha- unless that person that you're hiring off the street has no experience at all in in freight or in that industry, and you're going to train them the way the company wants that person to be trained. I think that's great. But if you're applying for a job at UPS Freight and you come from FedEx Freight and there's an operations manager position open, and you got the choice between somebody that works at that terminal or at that company but you just disregard those people and hire the guy from FedEx Freight, I think that's BS. I think you need to give an incentive to your employees, to your drivers to want to move up in your company, to want to stay at that company or stay at that facility versus just hiring from outside. I think I, I just, I, and the, the, the freight carrier that I worked here in Dallas for five years, the problem with them was, is they, they started hiring outside people up at the top at the executive level. So when these people got in, they completely disregarded the people that have been with the company for a long time. They didn't have that sense of loyalty. And pretty much, well, pretty much everybody that works on, pretty much everybody that's an operations manager or a current supervisor now at this particular facility in Dallas is all from another company. Right. They're either from Southeastern Freight Lines or from Estes, they're from FedEx Freight, they're from SIA. None of the guys are original, but you got dock workers that have been working on that dock for 15 years who have tried to apply for dock supervisor positions and they've got overlooked. And then they brought in some Yahoo from another freight carrier to take that dock supervisor position. Are they, well, you got a guy who's been here for 15 or 20 years Are they look, as a dock worker. Are they looking for any particular uh, specific education for these positions that the dock worker may not have? No, no, no. I got buddies that are there now who've been there for 10 or 15 years who are dock workers making more money than people with college degrees. And they know the computer system. They know how to move freight around on the dock. They know how to do it all. They know the whole uh, computer system that this company has. They have all the capabilities to be a dock supervisor. But for some reason, every time they put in, they always overlook them for another dock supervisor at another company. Or, you know, uh, this guy knows somebody from ABF. You know, so when I was working there, they they hired a terminal man, uh, one of our assistant terminal managers. They have three terminal ma- assistant terminal managers and one terminal manager because it's a huge facility. There's like 600 people. They brought this guy in from ABF. He was the assistant terminal manager or he was he's well, he is one of the assistant terminal managers. Do you know how many dock supervisors this guy brought along with him from ABF? At least four or five. Okay. You've just lost five opportunities for some of the dock workers that have been there for years to move up in the company because you wanted to bring these other yahoos from another company who don't know the way of the current company that you're working for. And I, I absolutely see your logic there. You, you know what I mean? I, I just think it's ridiculous. And don't edit none of that. <laughs> I want the whole world to know that. Well, I'll be happy to make sure that your vehement opinion gets put in there. That's not a problem. 
Oh, but that's the whole trucking industry is like that. It just drives me nuts because there's a lot of good people out there. There's a lot of great drivers who have the same mindset as I do, who, you know, because it, it would be nice to drive a truck for five or 10 years and maybe move up into an office position, have a, a, a more of a professional, you know, job and maybe just something that's, you know, still staying in trucking, but just doing something different. You know what I mean? I think having that background and knowing what the guys on the road are experiencing and doing gives you a different perspective when you're processing whatever it is you do once you get up into management. When I, when I was on the road, I had plenty of customers tell me, hey, why don't you be a sales rep? Dude, I, I used to go to these customers back up to their loading dock and my computer would tell me how much the customer had before I even picked up there. So I'd make all my deliveries, eat lunch, and then go make all my pickups. And it was pretty much the same customers every day. I would look at my computer before I walked into the customer's warehouse. It would tell me one pallet, uh, 700 pounds going to so-and-so, uh, whatever city it was going to. I would go in there and talk to these customers and just try to see if I can get other companies freight because they would have all the companies freight lined out on their dock. They would have <laughs> all the different freight carriers, seven or eight. I'd be like, hey, did so-and-so show up today? Let me get their freight. And sometimes they would give me other companies freight. Hey, Mike, we really like you. Let me, let me give you their freight. They got two or three pallets. We'll put it on your truck. Just put new stickers on it and put it on your trailer. That's nice. So right so right there as a driver, I just made a sales call. So I went from picking up one pallet at this customer to picking up four or five pallets. So I just doubled the revenue or, or tripled the revenue because this particular freight carrier that I worked for in Dallas, they figured every shipment or every pallet that we put on our trailer was roughly two hundred and fifty to three hundred dollars per pallet. So I went from doing three hundred dollars to four or five pallets to doing fifteen hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. A lot, a lot of my customers were like, oh, Mike, you would make a good sales rep or you should become an operations manager or something. You know, you should try to move up in the company since you've been driving for, uh, you know, a little bit now. And I tried and it just never happened. Hmm. And I got buddies that are currently working there now struggling with the same thing. We talk about it all the time. I talk to them all the time about it. So all that being said, what what is Mike going to do? What is your plans? What is your what is your goal? I'm trying to figure out a way to work from home and make money in my underwear. Okay. <laughs> I'm just, no, I'm trying to trying to figure out a way to stay in transportation, you know, work off a, a laptop or, or work off iPad or whatever. Just try to, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, maybe going into brokerage or some kind of logistics operations or something like that. Cause I don't want to drive a truck forever. Right. Now, would that be similar to a dispatcher? Um, if I wanted to be a dispatcher, I'd have to go back to a trucking company and work for somebody. Okay. Or unless I bought a whole bunch of trucks and I just, you know, I got an office and dispatched my own trucks. Well, earlier. But if I just wanted to be a traditional dispatcher. Earlier, you said that you could hire a dispatching service to, to help you if you wanted to have somebody yes. on the job boards. What if you offered a service like that where you would, you would be monitoring all the boards and you'd have drivers that you would help find loads? That's something I can look into, too. I just haven't really looked into that because I don't know if you actually have to have a company or how that works. I just know there's a, a dispatching services out there that you can link up with, like me as a solo driver right? with one truck and one trailer. I can link up with a dispatch service and they'll find me loads and I don't have to do anything. Okay. I've been driving for 10 years, so there's a lot of things, a lot of different roads I can go down. I'm just trying to figure it out as far as what, what my next step is in the in the industry because I'm, I'm always trying to figure out a way to have a different source of income or have multiple sources of income, just not one source of income. Right. Do you read? Are you a reader? I do like ebooks and stuff like Dave Ramsey ebooks. Awesome. Okay. Stuff like that. I don't really actually read a book. I'll throw some headphones on and listen to a book while I'm, or listen to a book in the truck while I'm driving down the road. Okay. So, so a lot of the books, like you're talking about the Dave Ramsey book, it would be an audio book that you'd be listening to. Yeah, I do. Yeah. I'll, I'll listen to a lot of audio books. I don't really read that much. I, I read like articles on LinkedIn and stuff like different. Uh, transportation business articles and stuff, but I don't actually read books. Well, I think the fact that you're listening to books that are beneficial is really helping leverage those hours and hours and hours that you're just driving down the road. Oh yeah, I'm a huge. Uh, I'm I love Dave Ramsey, so I love listening to his ebooks and his audio books. He's got probably six or seven something like that ebooks or audio books. So I'm I'm I love. Uh, I love what he's doing out there for people and trying to get debt free because a lot of what he does and a lot of what he talks about is also goes into running a business. Right. 
you know, you can't, it's hard to, it's hard to run a successful business being in debt. Yes. Whether it's personal debt or business debt. Have you, and I've, I've downloaded this. I have not yet read it, but have you listened or read his latest? It's called Entree Leadership. I have it. I'm actually going through the process of listening to it. It's probably one of the best books that he has teaching you how to be a leader and an entrepreneur. Right. And I'm looking forward to reading it. I, I haven't, I haven't even opened. Well, it's an electronic book, so I haven't even opened up a single pixel, but I'm looking forward to it. It, was, it came highly recommended by, uh, by Jacob Gutman. A lot of, uh, a lot of another guy who I, I tell a lot of my owner operator buddies about is, uh, Kevin Rutherford on, uh, Sirius XM uh, radio, uh, Road Dog Trucking Radio, Channel 146. Um, he does a show, depending on what time zone you're on, uh, in Dallas, it's from 10 to 1. He does a show for three hours called Trucking Business and Beyond. And he actually talks about, you know, getting debt free. He preaches a lot of the same stuff that Dave Ramsey talks about, but he just talks about it in a trucking sense from a business standpoint of running a truck, not not going into a whole bunch of debt to to start a trucking company and not being in a whole bunch of debt to get your truck on the road and you know you know making sure you're getting your debts paid off as fast as possible during the busy times so that way when you're in the slow times you're not stressing so much about oh my god I didn't get a load this week how am I going to pay for insurance or oh my god I didn't get a load this month how am I going to make my truck payment or my trailer payment so and actually uh he tells a lot of the owner operators that call into a show cuz his his show is pretty much strictly based about the owner operator that gear. I mean, a lot of company drivers call and stuff, but his show is geared so much towards the owner operator that he actually tells owner operators to listen to Dave Ramsey. That's awesome. And understanding how to get that free. Right. Yeah. So it's a, it's a good piece. Okay. It's a lot of good stuff. Well, I'll add that to the show notes as well. Thank you. I think we're going to wrap this up. Anything else that you want to get off your mind before we do? No, sir. Just uh, stay safe. Keep the shiny side up and keep the rubber side down. Always good advice. Make sure always profitable. Always put money in the bank. Keep the shiny side up and the rubber side down. Awesome. Michael, I appreciate so much you coming on the show and, and telling me telling me about your world. And I hope that everybody else enjoys it as well. And thank you. Thank you, sir. I appreciate everything. Thank you for inviting me on your show today. The trivia question for this episode is, what year was air conditioning invented? Coming up on the next episode of the Blue Collar Voices is a conversation with Justin Yoke. Justin works as a lifting specialist in West Virginia. He gets down and dirty, sometimes in the mines, helping companies with lifting equipment. Well, lifting specialist, it's pretty similar to um, your normal outside sales rep, except it's a lot more hands-on. And uh, what we do, our, our product line ranges from uh, lifting slings, custom lifting slings, to overhead cranes, to uh, engineered lifters, such as spreader beams, lifting tongs, uh, coil lifters. Um, so it's, uh, it's an industry in which um, you kind of got to get out there and see these applications firsthand. Um, you got to talk to the people, you got to see how they're being used and, and what they're trying to accomplish to really get these products right, to make the application safe, which is the most important thing. So um, that's basically how I usually describe it. It's kind of like an outside sales rep, but uh, a lot more hands-on. You know, I'm not going to show up in wingtip shoes and a $500 shirt. I got I, I go to work every day in my steel toes, a pair of jeans, a rouster polo and a rouster ball cap. Uh, knowing that there's a good chance that I'm going to be getting dirty. So, Hey guys, before you go, two things. The first is I'm looking for more great guests for the Blue Collar Voices show. Basically, I'm looking for those that excel in the Blue Collar arena and have actually got their hands dirty, truly understanding what it is like to do the work. I realize this is an older podcast, but I'm updating this podcast in November 2019 for the announcement of an upcoming road trip. Phase one is building a list of locations to visit. Some locations will be just a meet and greet. Others will be on-site audio and or video. Please check out the website for more information. I'd love to hear from you. Email me at johnc at bluecollarvoices.com. You can also hit me up on LinkedIn. Thanks all. Looking forward to hearing from you. Blue Collar Voices is produced by John Chapman and all audio, video, graphics. 
are created and edited by John Chapman. Blue Color Voices is a DR7 Media production. I'll be back.